Uh, good day, everybody, and welcome to our in-person and online audience for our Women's Entrepreneurship Wednesday panel. Today, we're in Berkeley, California for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's Women's and Entrepreneurship Wednesday event. My name is Allison Schmidt. I'm a fellow at Berkeley Law, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology's Life Sciences Project. Uh, the Life Sciences Project is very much involved in many of the issues that we're going to be talking about today with our stellar panel. We're interested in exploring IP, innovation, regulatory, and privacy issues that affect the life sciences and pharmaceutical spaces. We have active research going on in all of these areas. We've also developed a number of programs and course offerings for our Berkeley Law students and for the community that promote innovation in the life sciences. Um, as part of my work, I lecture at Berkeley Law on a number of these issues. So I'm thrilled to serve as your MC today um, and joining our fantastic panel to hear what's gonna be a great discussion on funding your startup, what in investors are looking for, and what women entrepreneurs need to know. I wanna share a couple of housekeeping notes and then we will get to the action. So for those of you who have joined us online, if you get disconnected, please use the same link that you use to join the program to connect back with us. This event is being recorded. A copy will be made available on the Women's Entrepreneurship website and on the USPTO's YouTube channel. We will have time at the end of the panel discussion to take questions from the audience. For those of you who are attending virtually, please submit your questions through the Women's Entrepreneurship inbox. That is at we at USPTO.gov. So let's get this party started. To begin the program, it's my pleasure to introduce the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Kathy Vidal. Um, I always feel really privileged to get to introduce Director Vidal at events. She was actually one of my first legal bosses um, and, first, and, one, and just a fantastic mentor. I've long admired her as a role model, not only in the women's entrepreneurship space, but throughout IP in general. She really walks the walk on innovation and so it's, it's really our privilege here at Berkeley to welcome her and our panel today. Thank you, uh, Allison. Really appreciate those comments. Um, and good morning, everyone, both in person and online. Uh, so excited to be with you here today and to be with this incredible panel. Um, I am going to make a few remarks, and then we're going to go into some questions and answers from the panel. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and their stories as we go through them. Um, so happy to be here to talk about funding. You will find that the topics we discuss are going to be broader than funding. It's going to be about how to have a successful startup as a woman, um, how to be a successful woman entrepreneur. We know that while women represent the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs, they receive less capital, far far less capital than, uh, than men and others participating in the innovation ecosystem. They're also severely underrepresented when it comes to owners of businesses. Um, that's why at the Department of Commerce, we started the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative in November. I founded this with Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. What we want to do through this programming is bring you all of the resources and all of the information you would have, no matter where you were in the country, no matter how connected you were, no matter how much money you had. Um, we want the best to come to you, uh, to every woman in America. Um, we want to talk a little bit today about not only the opportunities and how you can be successful, but what some of the challenges are and how you can overcome them. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about VC funding, but as you'll hear, VC funding is not the be-all, end-all to every business, so look forward to sharing that. Um, we know even with VC funding that, um, that the rate of funding of women, we have fully women uh, founders is abysmal. It's about 2% of the funding from VC capital. So um, looking forward to talking a little bit about that um, and how we can all work together, not only the people in the room, but all of our networks to make you successful. So with that, I really want to launch into the questions. I want to start with uh, Caroline Winnett, the executive director, director of Berkeley Skydeck. Um, Caroline, let's start the conversation with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your role as the executive director of Berkeley's Accelerator? Maybe explain what an accelerator is um, and how your organization is helping women in the innovation ecosystem. Sure, happy to. Thanks, thanks, Kathy, and welcome to everybody in the room and online. Uh, so Berkeley Skydeck is UC Berkeley's largest startup acceleration and incubation program. Ah. We got a lot going on. Uh, it, it, we, we host over 250 startups per year in our four different programs. Uh, the, here's, here's the cool thing to know about Skydeck. We look and feel like a private company startup accelerator, demo day, funding, moving the companies really, really fast. 
but we're not a private company. We are a Berkeley program, and that's the secret to our magic is bringing in the incredible resources of UC Berkeley, the network, the 500,000 living alums, to come and help support our startups in our mission-based, uh, our mission-driven organization to help innovation and entrepreneurship and also support UC Berkeley. Uh, what's an incubator versus an accelerator? It's, it's actually really rather simple. An accelerator has a definite time frame. There's funding for the startups. Excel why is it called an accelerator? Simply, we need to move the startups very fast towards demo day, introducing them to investors. Incubator, not necessarily a specific timeline, no demo day, no funding. Uh, we, can, we accept startups at a much earlier stage. Um, lots of Berkeley student founders in that program. And then we also have two international programs. We have a location now in Milan, Italy. And we also have a, a program that's open to founders outside the US that want to come and launch here in the US. So that's the rapid fire overview of Berkeley Skydeck. Well, and, and that's fantastic. And I think what everybody needs to know is there are these incubators and accelerators throughout the country that uh, now is a key point in history where there's so much, and you'll hear from all the panelists, there's so much out there to help you start a company. Um, what would you say are the key steps to building a startup? And what are some of the tips you would offer to aspiring women entrepreneurs as they navigate the startup process? Sure. Oh, there we go. Mike's on. People are doing it for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the early stage because that's what we focus on at Berkeley Sky Skydeck, very early inception stage um, and just getting into the market. So I would say at that stage, there's a couple of key things. You got to find a problem, a real problem, not something that seems like a problem, but something that really is a pain point for somebody somewhere. Number one. Number two, it has to be enough somebodies, right? So we're ta I'm talking about venture-backed businesses. If it's a very small number of somebodies, it's maybe a business, a small business. Fantastic. Those are great and amazing. Lots of women do that. But if we're talking about venture-backed, it's got to have a big, fat market eventually. Maybe not necessarily at first, but the entrepreneur has to paint the picture of, this is my first little market, and then this is my giant, world-changing market. And then the third thing is that the entrepreneur has to be willing to slog through, you know, nails, snow, you know, broken glass, uh, <laughs> rejection, all of those lovely things which uh, Tara, who's the founder, uh, <laughs> is nodding her head uh, because they are so darn determined to solve that problem and, and are not going to quit. So that's some of the big, the big things that, that must be there. Well, I love your point about you have to find a problem. Um, I interviewed the first African-American woman patentee this century, um, which is amazing. I mean, it's, it, it's sad that she was the first, but um, the problem that she found was she had issues going out and her hair getting wet. And so she, her patent is on a hood, um, and she now has an entire business on that. So it's interesting when we bring more women and we bring more people with diverse backgrounds into the innovation ecosystem, oftentimes we're solving for things that are even more empathetic. So um, just really appreciate that. Um, so for these, um, for these people who want to be startups, for these women, what are common mistakes that you've seen made when trying to get investment in the companies? Yeah, so... So first I'll say, it's just a reality of life that the bar is higher for women. It, it just is. So we can debate why and all that stuff, but let's just recognize it is. And who makes that bar higher, both men and women? That's another reality that we just have to face. So what, what does that mean if you're a, a woman entrepreneur, your, your practical day-to-day -day challenges? You have to jump higher than a man does. It, you just have to. What does that mean? You have to be bolder. You have to be more confident. You have to have more, a, a bit of a word called hubris, right? Which is, I'm right. I am right about this. This is going to work, right? At the same time, I don't know how I'm going to get to solving this problem. I'm completely open to the path I take to get there. But I'm going to solve this problem, right? No doubt in my mind, this is something that men are perhaps born to have more naturally. We can have a long discussion about neuroscience in the brain, um, but we certainly know socially, right? They get a lot more, you're doing well feedback, and women get less, and, and that's the reality. So that means whoever you are, whatever your personality is, and whether you're very soft-spoken, completely fine, 
right? You just need to really portray an incredibly clear vision with total determination that you're gonna solve that problem. So um, on that topic, we know there are so many women now out there trying to help women secure funding and um, working on whether it's helping to mentor them, whether it's getting out there and actually funding women. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that and what should aspiring entrepreneurs not do when they're launching a startup? Uh, don't give up, I would say. Don't ever give up. Uh, pivot, right, but don't give up. So, so at Skydeck, this is, you know, we're a Berkeley program. This is something we're very focused on. Uh, we have a DEI committee. We have uh, a lot of workshops and seminars for both women, female founders. Uh, we're, we're doing more for founders of color. And we're helping all we can once they get into the program so that they feel supported, they get the the mentorship they need, they get that extra boost of, okay, let's make sure that your pitch, your presentation is absolutely rock solid. Uh, you know, there's, there's two parts of the problem. One is how many women are applying to our program, right, which we can change somewhat, right, by making it sure if someone comes to our website or goes to, to a webinar, they go, that, I'm welcome there. That, that we, we, we do that as much as we can, but we can, what we can do more of is once they're in the program, give them a lot of support. I personally work a lot with the female founders uh, for additional pitch coaching and, and support. And we feel like that darn needle is incredibly hard to move. It's really hard to move. And you mentioned that dismal, awful, horrifying number of 2% of all female founded startups getting venture funding, which is just horrendous. It's so far from 50%, right? So we have a long way to go. But we try to see what kind of little steps we can take along the way to try to move that darn needle. Well, I appreciate that. And it's interesting because the 2% is an abysmal statistic. But when you contrast that with the fact that women entrepreneurs are the largest group of grow, you know, growing entrepreneurs, they're getting money from somewhere. So maybe that's a good time to transition to Tara DeBauer, um, the PhD founder and CEO of BioAmp Diagnostics. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you built a startup. And maybe you could address, you know, if only 2% of funding is going to women, where are these women getting the money and, and what can we tell them to help support them? Great. Well, thank you, um, Director Vidal. Um, so my background, I, I'm what we call a technical founder. So I uh, have a very stringent uh, technical research background. Um, but my family is actually uh, small business owners. And my mom runs a business. And so I think that's an important part of my story. Um, so what I've seen and what's been modeled to me is that women are part of businesses. And, and my dad um, really supported my mother uh, growing up and was, was took care of a lot of the administrative and operational side of the business. So it, it kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of I'm coming into this with a very very unique vantage point, I believe, and it's something that I've recognized. Um, but I, uh, my journey as an entrepreneur was really unexpected. Um, in 2015, I came to UC Berkeley after um, uh, receiving my PhD in bioinorganic chemistry. And I always worked at the interface of chemistry, uh, medicine, and biology. But when I got to UC Berkeley, there was this fantastic opportunity to start to work with this amazing consortium of a whole number of, of experts in the space of public health, of, of, of medicine, of mi microbiology. And as a chemist, they came to me and said, can we build unique diagnostic technologies that are kind of unique and different from everything that else is out, that is out there um, that can help really combat this larger global healthcare issue of antibiotic resistance? So so you have a whole number of experts at the table saying, this is the need. Can you design it? Can you build it? And can you make it in a way that's going to be scale scalable globally? And those are already checking lots of boxes from when you're considering building a business, right? You need, the, you need a big problem. You need to understand what the what do the users want? What do they need? What is, who's going to buy this test or the product that you're building? Um, and so I think those were, uh, that's the, the journey of my story is it started there. And I actually wanted to be a faculty member. So I was at Berkeley getting ready to kind of move on into a faculty position. And then we had kind of groundbreaking results that came out from a really fantastic feasibility study at a public hospital, Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. And it really changed everything. And I recognized that to be able to get this out of the university was going to have to be uh, me and then the team that we that we built to, to ultimately translate it out. Um, who we get funding from. <laughs> so we are in early stages. We're pre-commercialization. 
So we are really predominantly funded by angel investors. And angel investors have children that go to the emergency department on a Saturday night and are having a, maybe a urinary tract infection, simple infections, and are seeing the way that the diagnostic kind of approaches and technologies that are currently available and the limitations. So it's much easier for, for me as a storyteller and somebody who kind of was living and breathing this technology, it was very easy for me to connect with angel investors and really explain to them the problems and needs and then talk about the business. And a lot of our um, angel investors are multi-time founders, so they understand what we're trying to build and the complexities, and that's been instrumental for us um, in our growth. Well, and, and that's fantastic, and we hear that on, on the journey to being an entrepreneur, oftentimes you start with friends and family, so you get, uh, it's good to have a good network so you can get your friends and family to invest, and then if you were to look at the stages, not everybody goes to VC investing, but when they do get angel funds, usually that's before VC investing. Um, can you just explain a little bit about that to people who don't know the difference between angel investors and venture capitalists, and how you go about looking for angel investments? Yeah, so I'm very lucky because we have a fantastic ecosystem here at UC Berkeley. So actually our first dollars in were actually a student group from UC Berkeley. And that was the first, that was a spark. And then there was a whole number of angel networks that are attached to UC Berkeley that helped us raise our initial funds. And a lot of these people are technical um, technical founders, many of them, who understand what we were building. And sometimes that's what, for a deep tech technology a company like ours, where you have kind of complex chemistry driving your innovation, you have to be able to describe that in a pretty uh, succinct way to investors to overcome some of the risks. And that can be that can be kind of trying. So I think in those early days, being able to, to recognize your limitations and you're approving out a lot of your market, the kind of bigger picture workflow of how you're gonna actually build a product and for who. And there's a big transition between those angel investors who are willing to sit there, roll up their sleeves and try to figure out your business with you versus a VC that's saying, tell me what the opportunity is here. Tell me what the change is gonna be. Tell me that bigger picture story. And that's there's a big difference in those. And it's because of their models. Angel investors sometimes are philanthropic Topic. They're trying. They want to see the world to be a better place, and so they're they're funding an idea that's maybe meeting a need that they really think that just has to be there. The solution has to be there. Where VCs are thinking about that aspect, some there are philanthropic VC groups, but they are raising huge funds that have uh, time scales to them. Right? They need to return investment to these people that have put money into this pot. So they are they're built. They have a business. They're startups actually. VCs are very much startups. They're current always raising money and always having to return that money to the people that have invested in their funds. So they are looking for how fast are you going to be able to make your transaction into some kind of exit, whether that be exit moving your product to the market, exit moving your, your company to IPO, exit getting acquired by another company, right? Some kind of transaction that's going to mean the exit for them. So their ideals are just different. Yeah. Well, and, and that's fantastic. And one thing that I want to be a takeaway from this session is, although everybody is talking about their own experiences, these kinds of um, networks, these um, you know, the access is everywhere. So you heard about incubators and accelerators. They don't just exist here in Silicon Valley. You can, you can tap into them. Um, you heard about angel investment networks that uh, Tara had access to, but there are these networks throughout the country, or you can tap into the ones here in Silicon Valley. So uh, really good to know. Uh, one other thing is you hear a lot from Silicon Valley. You assume that everybody you know, all these companies came out of VC funding. And that's not true. And I will say, in addition to what we discussed, there's also government funding. Oh, yes. So a lot of the businesses in Silicon Valley that are extremely successful, some of the initial funding was from the government where you didn't need that quick ROI. So we want to make sure everybody's connected to all those resources. So uh, you can comment on that. And here's the next question for you. Uh, can you tell us some key steps um, that you can take as a woman entrepreneur to make your business ready and, and make your business um, enticing for funding? There's so many things. So, so I'm going to focus, because of the conversation, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the IP side of things. And again, through the lens of um, an academic um, entrepreneur, uh, one of the things that you can do is you have to have such a deep network of people that are helping you. And one of the kind of instrumental um, kind of entities on a university campus is your tech transfer office. And uh, is an, as a scientist, all I think about is how do you create a solution? And then as an entrepreneur, you have to think about how are you going to get the, this solution out into the hands of the users, right? And the people that are going to actually use this technology. And that aspect, the first step is actually getting the intellectual property that is needed to build your product out of the university. And so it turns out the tech transfer office, uh, very early on, I had no idea I was going to start a company. but. 
Berkeley, they said, hey, we hear you have a new technology. Maybe you should come and talk to the, t the tech transfer office. I made a very long-lasting relationship with our tech tra transfer office representative, who I call and talk to frequently when we're going through patent um, uh, examinations and things like that. You, they end up being a, a, a long-term partner for an academic um, partner. So I think in, in the idea that when an investor says, oh, I don't know about this license agreement that you have, that you've created with, an, with this academic university, the fact that I can get my tech transfer representative on the phone with that investor and have a conversation with them, it brings a lot of, um, I think, depth to them understanding that I understand our business and our risk, and I've built those relationships where I've needed to. Um, so that's been, that's one really big area. Well, and, and that's uh, an interesting challenge that when you're in a university developing IP, um, the ownership is something that you, you've got to contend with. If you're a woman entrepreneur out there and you're not part of a university, you don't have that, which is fantastic. Um, and I will say the USPTO has pro bono organizations throughout the entire country that are standing by to answer your questions. If you're under-resourced, they can help you secure your IP. Some of them are through universities. Some of them are through nonprofits. So I would encourage everybody to check that out. Um, with that, I want to move on to Lisa Bell. Um, we go way back, um, obviously. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, love to hear a little bit more about your experience and the work that you're doing at PayPal. Sure. Um, so I've been in Silicon Valley for 20 years, primarily focused on fintech payments and digital money movement. Um, so it's no surprise that uh, I work at PayPal right now. Um, and um, I started uh, in PayPal really working on Venmo and, and product management, uh, but seeing this problem in tech where I was always the only one, the only woman, the only black person on team and in product and engineering teams, I really saw venture capital as a way to change the problem. And so within PayPal as a um, our response to racial equity, we launched a $535 million commitment to racial equity. And it is now my full-time job to lead what we call the Economic Opportunity Fund. It's a $100 million investment into black and brown GPs. So GPs are general partners. They are the people who manage the fund. And so if we move who gets the capital and who gets to make investment decisions, we change that number of that 2% or that dismal less than 1% that uh, people of color and women get in venture. So that's the whole thesis of the fund to empower us to move our money and capital investment decisions so that we actually provide access to capital. And that's what I do. Yeah, that, that so, and we were talking about this a bit offline. So many businesses are doing this. And right. um, you know, this is why I think this is just now is the time um, for, for women to prosper, for those with diverse backgrounds to prosper, because not only are universities working in this direction, large companies are trying to, to lend support. So that, that's fantastic. So can you share your efforts outside of your professional capacity to encourage and support women entrepreneurs? Yeah, so um, working in tech, um, I really saw literally representation not change. And it still hasn't changed. If you look at the numbers, uh, we still don't have major significant movement in who works in tech and gets the access to get these pre-IPO companies. And so I started an angel investing firm. It's called Black. It's called BLX for Black and Latinx women to really try to amplify. You know, we get less than one percent, ninety percent of capital that we get, but to invest in these Black and Brown women entrepreneurs who are really trying to scale and don't know how to get access to VC. Um, even in my journey as trying to be an angel investor and eventually become a venture capitalist, it was extremely difficult despite me being at Berkeley Haas and going to these schools that have access. It's still extremely difficult if you don't have that network or if it's disparate. So that's a lot of the work that I do is really encouraging um, women entrepreneurs to seek venture. I know it's not friendly, um, but if we don't try and we don't get that access, we don't move the needle. And we absolutely have to do that. So that's interesting because you're, you're right. One of the things that I hear about venture is they invest, venture capitalists invest in people, not necessarily right. in ideas, and they invest in people with a track record. So if you don't get in there in the beginning, we're just perpetuating the statistics. Um, but I also love that you know, there are women like you um, across the country that are going into this space. Um, as a member of the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, we're also working across the Department of Commerce to try and get more people of color, more women into the funding area so that there will be more funding of women and, and, and folks who are diverse. So, um, so that is fantastic and I just want everybody to realize that, that there are, there are people like you out there um, and when they're looking for venture funding, think about the people whose mission it is 
to fund what it is that you're offering, whatever that Absolutely. is and however you, however you relate to that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges and barriers that women entrepreneurs face when it comes to securing funding um, and how you can overcome those? Yeah, um, so um, unfortunately, if you're a woman and you're providing a business that um, serves women, uh, the VCs call it a pink ghetto. Uh, and deter determine it uninvestable. But you think about beauty, these are billion dollar businesses, <laughs> Spanx. Um, we, we've disproven this myth again and again, but essentially because the men across the table don't understand your concept because it's not their lived experience. And so that's why it is important to target women angels, women VC firms, people who already get it so you don't have to waste time explaining the problem to people who will never understand or who have to go ask their wife or daughter about is this really a problem. So I think you have to be really succinct about who you're targeting, who you're seeking support from, or if you want to take on that burden of explaining because you know 99% of capital was ran by white men and so you can't go too far without tapping into that wealth of the ecosystem but really when you're first getting started you, you can actually tap into people who get your value and will amplify your work for you and be an ambassador of the work that you do and help tackle those hurdling fundraisers. I love the ambassador concept. In one of our first We Wednesdays, one of the panelists said that when you go to a venture capitalist and they don't want to fund you, make them an ambassador for you. Say, who else might want to fund me? And, and right. use them, uh, use every opportunity you have, which is fantastic. So now you, you're a women entrepreneur, you get the money. Um, the one thing that we've heard is, don't just get as much money as you can. You need to be careful with the money, the amount of money that you get, how you spend it, how you budget it. Can you address that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely hard for women entrepreneurs who are pre-revenue to raise capital because people want to, want to see that you have proof that you're going to return this money back. Um, and so the good news about venture capital is that you don't have to pay it back, uh, but the bad news is that they will be on you um, <laughs> and tracking every, every bit of your progress. And so you do have to be a steward of this, this, this capital that you're getting, which means, and women are generally more conservative with capital point blank period. We don't throw parties, uh, you know, waste it all away. We really are being mindful. And so I think you prove that with, you know, strong accounting, strong books, um, strong use of capital. So is it more focused on R&D, uh, technical resources versus on ops and, and, and HR, right? People want to see that you're really putting the money to fuel the product that you're building. And that really gives uh, investors confidence and will give them um, every investor you want to re-up, essentially. You're going to have to ask your investors for more money <laughs> over time. So it just builds that confidence that you are a great steward of the capital. That's fantastic. Before I move on to Angela McFarlane, JD CEO of Perceive Biotherapeutics, Inc., I want to remind everybody in the audience to please submit your questions. Um, we are going to wrap up a little bit early so we can answer the exact questions that you have. So uh, please make sure you do that. Angela, um, you founded an incubator, um, which I understand has led to establishing eight companies. Um, and I got a text right after we announced this panel by someone, I'll tell you who it is later, who said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you got her on the panel. So I, I, I was so excited about that. Um, tell, us about, um, tell us about the insights you've gained into what goes into starting a company. Sure, and delighted to be here, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really inspired by what I've heard so far, so I'll, I'll, there are a lot of uh, similar themes in, in what I've experienced, but I'll try and point those things that, that are a little bit different. Um, so my background, I'm, I'm an attorney by training, so I came into venture startups um, very early in my career, kind of unexpectedly, about 30 years ago, and started working for a med tech startup where I really just dove in deep to find out what were the things about that business that I could help, you know, as a generalist. And it really was it really was shepherding the technology. It was the intellectual property. It was understanding, you know, what were we really connecting with the novelty of what we were developing with the patents themselves and to really put a strong portfolio in place. And so that was something I learned very early. And I also learned that, um, and my experience has been just an incredible, um, incredible experience with that of mentorship. So we've heard a lot about alliances here and about you know going out on your own, but I think the, the most important thing and most transformational thing in my career, um, which has touched you know 25 startups, I've been part of very successful businesses. I'm running a gene therapy company now for treating macular degeneration and, and just kind of things I can't believe myself. But really it was that, that mentorship that early on showed me that I could question, I could 
aggressively question the status quo or question why something was being done and be given given cover to continually qu question and learn as I was going. So I think, and I actually think this is something that women in particular do very well. Like we, we want to know, we want to know the bottom line and we kind of persistent in that questioning and not, not feeling, um, I think, kind of inhibited about about asking questions when we need to know something. And I think that that curiosity is something that really kind of sets an entrepreneur apart. Building, building the businesses that, that we've done, um, and in an incubator setting, we were set up a little bit differently and then we had dedicated VC funding, so they let us have that, that, that rope to kind of go and find the best solution and then come back and start the business with it. But it really was that partnership and my leadership there um, when I, when I took over the CEO role at the incubator was really my style was more about I inclusion of all folks and board member and VC. Like if I had someone who was a difficult funding person or a board member of VC, I would bring them into the team and have them be part of the solution. And I think that style of inclusion, I think the leadership that it takes to really bring businesses forward. Yes, it's about, it's about the technology. Yes, it's about solving the problem. Yes, it's about the funding. But I think there is a leadership component here that is incredibly important because VCs and everybody, they do invest in the people. And I think what, when I interview someone or we're looking for executives, I always say like, who gives you cover? I wanna know like, who is the person that you go to to speak your mind, to have that candor moment with? Because I think that there's a lot of great technologies about out there. I think it really is the people that differentiate and it's the leadership that differentiates. And I think the more more humble, the more candor, the more inclusive, the more curious, those things are incredibly powerful. And at the end of the day, when you're pitching someone, yes, you want to be strong and, and know your stuff, you need to be expert, but you also are creating a connection with someone at a very deep level, even in a pitch. And that those, those elements of who you are need to come to the surface and they really need to be part of your package because that is what really will create the connection. People either invest in, in VCs, everybody, they invest in people they know or they've made money with before and if you don't have that, they are going to invest in people they feel they can trust and they will. if you can show who you are, even your vulnerabilities and your ability to say I don't know or you know, those are that builds trust, and that's absolutely critical when you're breaking into something. So that's just maybe more on the leadership side after 30 years of you know slogging through it. <laughs> well, and I think that's fantastic advice. That I don't think anybody can underestimate the value of networks and the value of mentorships or sponsorship. Um, that that's one of the things that if you've been successful, you already have that. So just to proactively build that is so critical. Um, and, and we know, getting back to Caroline's point about neuroscience, we know women thrive when they work with each other. Um, so just having that network and be able to, to, to work together um, is amazing. I know that as part of we, we are building networks for people. We are building mentorships. Um, I, everybody who speaks on a panel has always said you're welcome to contact them directly. Uh, there's also inventor groups throughout the entire country if you're inventing something. Uh, there's all kinds of organizations you can engage involved in to, to build those networks. Um, so really look forward to everybody being able to do that. Um, if there's anything, is there anything you would do differently? Like, given where you are now on the other end of all this, having been successful, what would you tell your younger self? Oh, um, I would tell her that the, the curiosity and creativity and ability to create your own path was a good plan. I think I would also tell her that, you know, the breakthroughs I've had in leadership, which are more uh, about just having comfort in being yourself and really just bringing your authentic self forward at the very beginning um, it is absolutely critical. And I think for some time in my leadership career, I tried to be maybe something I wasn't. And that just, it broke. You know, it broke and it, it was definitely that moment of looking back and saying, you've got it, you're, you're on it, and you have the right tools. And when you add expertise to that, and you add the passion to that, and you add the drive, and you add all of those things, I mean, that's really what breaks through for people. I mean, I've just been incredibly lucky. I worked with very um, creative uh, surgeons in the field, people that have their hands on the problem, being able to shepherd that in terms of technology, and then coming to found companies myself, being able to understand and see that eureka moment. 
you know, when you when you see something needs to be solved, they call it the eureka moment. Like having seen that a few times, like that is worth following, and that's the kind of thing that really gives you the passion to keep going, and you know, make sure that that you don't ignore that, and and you know that that's really like incredible advice to to take to heart. And you know, th these are, as you said, these are broader leadership lessons, including on authenticity. And it, it's one more reason why it's important to find people who you feel like you can emulate. Um, as an as electrical engineer, I know I grew up around mostly men, and it wasn't until a little bit later in life that I realized my own authentic voice because I was emulating what I saw. So just another reason to have these great relationships with women and um, and these mentorships. So I do want to hit on one thing before we before we move on to Colleen. Um, when we were talking before this. Um, we talked about what was important for every deal, and um, I would love, I would love, given given the importance we know. Well, I, I don't want to steal the lead, so tell us what's important for so, every deal. <laughs> so I have been part of founding or shepherding probably 25 companies. Uh, Foresight Labs, which was the incubator we founded in 2005, has spun out. Um, eight companies all have successfully exited, other than those that are either in strategic partnerships or um, or still privately funded. Um, and strategic partnerships, I just want to give a shout out to when you don't actually have a company, you have a product, really looking at licensing, looking at strategic deals, that's actually a very active area in the ecosystem. Even companies that will let you run the business for a certain period of time with their capital, either convertible notes or other mechanisms, and then they end up having an option. And if they don't, you've still got a viable business and you've been funded in a very non-dilutive way. Um, but at the end of the day, whether it be a license, and particularly we've done mostly acquisitions, um, you always think your patents are fine because you know you, you file the patent, you have the you have the breakthrough moment, you get it filed, you you prosecute it, you're getting some claims. At the very every deal I've ever worked on, it's probably 15 plus. It's always been about the patents at the end. So, yes, patents at the beginning, but I'm telling you, patents at the end. Every deal comes down to some kind of patent question, and so making sure that you are either as the leadership or the science lead or someone else really maintaining that understanding, that deep understanding, updating your filings, making sure that your claims are where they should be, looking at competitive landscape, looking at, at the, you know, what's happening else there, out there. The patent office itself is like one of the best databases. Yes, there's Google and other things, but the USPTO has incredible resources for that. You can look back and see if anybody's got what they're doing in their prosecution. You can look and see um, if they still have claims pending. You can see so much. And so I'd say, you know, just a, a shout out to the, the, the dire importance of both patents in our country and also patents to all small businesses in so many ways. And it's a hard fight. It's got, you've got to be novel. You've got to have that, that ingenuity, that reason why your, your product is different. But, but that's the beauty of, of, of a strong product anyway. So just, yes, absolutely. Director Vidal, thank you for you know, being here and helping highlight that. It's very important. Well, and, and I will just say that the USPTO has so many free resources, whether it's just boot camps on how you can learn about different IP. We have an IP identifier tool so you can identify the types of intellectual property you, you, ha you, know, you have, uh, the pro bono resources. We have pro se um, assistance if you want to go about it yourself. I mean, there, there's so much available out there. And you know, for those who are investing, they need to make sure their investment is solid. So you may have an amazing idea, but if you don't protect it, they could throw a lot of money at the idea and then anybody they could copy it because you haven't you haven't prevented that in any way. So uh, thank you for highlighting that. Um, so I, I want to turn to one of my colleagues. Um, I say that loosely. Colleen Chen is a professor at Santa Clara University. Um, she's also an Edison Distinguished Scholar and Expert Consultant at the USPTO. Um, she worked at Commerce even before I, I came on board as director. Um, a ton of insights. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work um, at the USPTO and with startups. Thank you so much, and it's just a privilege to be on this panel, and so many of the insights were very resonant. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about myself, I think as an unconventional entrepreneur myself, because I've primarily been involved in building nonprofit initiatives, and um, I think, again, for those of you who may be sort of starting your journey, um, a lot of things to think about with respect to my own experience, I think, relate to what has already been said. 
trying to find and recognize those problems and really being very um, determined to see that they are solved. So I'm going to quote Angela Davis, who's talked about not accepting the things that I cannot change, but changing the things that I cannot accept. So for me, personally, I have been working in the realm of uh, second chances in the criminal justice system, talking about addressable market. One out of three American adults has a criminal record, and many of them live with uh, that record for the rest of their lives in terms of their um, blocking their opportunities. So that's a topic I'm very passionate about. I founded an initiative called the Paper Prisons Initiative, and it's been funded um, by various people. Uh, initially, I actually also had students who were my students who then became um, themselves a very successful entrepreneurs who wanted to invest in me. So just knowing that you are always pitching, if you are showing yourself to others, the, the projects and the uh, work will come towards you. I never thought I would do this. I was a, a person who was an engineer uh, working in patents and writing about uh, patent topics and entrepreneurship in the patent system, but when this topic came to me, I just could not unsee it, and again, naturally, the sort of the universe um, came, there were a lot of people who funded and wanted to fund the, the growth of that um, initiative. So. I think some of the things that are I've learned from studying startups and also you know, sort of being around startup folks, whether it be my students or people in the ecosystem living in Silicon Valley, you know, a lot of people have great ideas and are trying to start new things. Um, I think the two things that are really important from my own experience is first, to really find your tribe and to really find those people who are going to be excited about what you're working on that are going to excite you with what they're doing. And then so you start to see yourself your, in terms of your personal identity as, yes, I might be, you know, uh, working at home or I might be I have a day job or something else but I also a creative person who sees problems and really wants to try to change and solve them and I can and I really can have that big impact so I would encourage you at whatever stage you're at you know I don't know how many of us have the luxury of being an, a full-time entrepreneur uh, and not having to worry about the bills I think a lot of us will be transitioning at different stages so I'd encourage everybody to find your tribe find those people who are going to feed your energy um, in whatever organization you are and it often comes in very unexpected places. I've been teaching at Santa Clara for 15 years. I've certainly had a lot of students come forward, tell me their personal stories, tell me the things that they can't really talk about publicly and how it's impacted them, how they've been blocked in this criminal justice realm. And that has really driven my passion to really try to address and solve their problems and speak for them um, where in some cases they can't. So. Um, that's when I think learning that I think a lot of people have talked about and I just really appreciate the leadership and the, the accomplishments of the women on this panel, As, especially Kathy, I am so excited and thrilled that you uh, took your leadership from the private sector into the patent office of the country is, is better off for it. Um, the other thing I would say is that, again, going back to thinking about the the issues that you're working on, um, you know, there is a book by Tanya Pink that called To Sell as Human. Um, and again, to really imagine that you have a lot of audiences that are out there. So we've talked about angel investors. Now, when I see, think about the term angel investor in Silicon Valley, I think about, you know, a boardroom on, on Sand Hill Road with all these people that are in it. Uh, but that's not actually what it is, right? Angel investors, as we know, could be that cousin, could be that relative, could be that patient that we see in the ER uh, on a Saturday night uh, whose parent sees the problem and recognizes that you actually could help a lot of people and gets excited about it. And going back to that eureka moment, it's not only about you know, thinking this could be an issue, but I remember even working on some of the patent issues I've worked on when I've seen uh, entrepreneurs talk about the impact of patenting on themselves. I have another initiative uh, called Diversity Pilots. If you go to that website slash diary, you will see entrepreneurs talking about their own experience in patenting. And even though I had been in the patent system for a long time, just to see them um, actually talk about what it meant to them to get that patent, right, to um, actually get the the endorsement, their creativity validated to um, get the esteem of their kids or their parents. They actually finally understood what they were doing. Um, that was really powerful to me. And I said, yeah, there's something out there that's really important to tap into and it needs to be elevated. So I think as women, often we are afraid to sort of put ourselves out as you know the leader or the, you know look at me I'm, how great I am and make it ego focused uh, and I think what the women on this panel have have shown by talking about their experiences is that we are problem solvers and we as part of that are inventing are creating completely new things uh, and so I think that uh, helps us overcome the sense that I, I'm not trying to you know t steal the limelight do things that might be um, less comfortable for women, but to realize that we really have a lot to offer and uh, we should be involved in that.
That, that's fantastic. And your point about finding your tribe. Um, I know that you mentioned find your tribe in your organization. I know one thing that I have found really helpful is finding it outside of my organization. You know, I feel like I have so many people in my tribe that are have different backgrounds than me, right? Some of them are more business people. Some of them are more on the finance side. Some of them, you know, it's so many different people. It's um, so important. Um, and, and the point about the patent, I, I love that. I will say that for, for one of the last weeks that we held in Phoenix, there was a woman who drove from San Diego with her patents in her car to get to, to, get to Phoenix to, to, to be there at WE. She got a flat tire. She stopped into two towns to fix her flat tire, could not fix it, and decided she would drive all the way on her flat tire because she didn't want to miss the ability to bring her patents and to be with us. I mean, that just shows that you know the patent has so much meaning to people who, who get the patent. Um, and I know that Colleen and I are working on processes to lower the barriers even more within the USPTO to make it more friendly, to make sure you know all the resources that are available to you when you do file for a patent. So really looking forward to, to working on that even more, to, to do more for everybody in the audience. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of IP for entrepreneurs and startups? Yeah, I want to really validate what you just talked about in terms of that personal experience. We know from research that's been done that getting that fat first patent can have transformative impacts for entrepreneurs. Um, so we think about the patent system as really uh, serving the entire ecosystem. So it's not really only for big companies or for established companies or even biotech companies. It really can be um, in a broad set of sectors. And I'm going to actually show uh, a, a design patent um, application um, technology to, again, encourage you all, even if you aren't necessarily working in the most um, cutting, you know, sort of cutting edge PhD level uh, science, you still can benefit from the patent system. And what we've seen is that from these studies, and there's a few of them that are out there, that that first patent catalyzes a lot of good things, right? It's not just about, yeah, I have this great, um, this document that's out there, but it really serves as a marker and a validation. So we're seeing um, that the first patent is correlated with more hiring, more uh, capital, whether it be venture or banking, um, and longer gestation. Um, you know, a lot of small companies, it's a real struggle for a long time. Um, companies that have that asset can continue to, to you know, th that's correlated with a, a greater um, uh, li life. And I think an important point that was made earlier is that that patent can also give you a lot of flexibility, right? So if you may not be um, somebody that is in a position to commercialize broadly, perhaps you can commercialize on some scale, but then p license to others who are able to bring your product to the masses. So I do want to show one product, if people don't mind, uh, which I think also shows the that that this person I met her uh, just two weeks ago, and she um, did a a, a clothing. Um, she has a clothing line, and so she put together these clothes that are just incredible. And I want to just model what she's put together. Her name is Bernice Pan, and she's an entrepreneur in London. Her name, and she has a company called Deploy. So she has. You can see my regular jacket here, but it's an adaptable jacket, and it has a series of small buttons. Um, and Hi, so you can take it off. And so if you're going out and you are you know, on the road, you don't want to bring three outfits, you can have a short jacket that's fun for going um, and, uh, and going to see, you know, going out at night. Um, not only that, she has a skirt that comes with it, which can be adapted, uh, and I'm probably not going to be able to attach it perfectly well, but the skirt goes around and it attaches to the jacket, and so it becomes a dress <laughs> that can be worn. And um, I'm just not fully getting it. Oh, here you go. Um, and again, the whole series of different elements are patentable. She had actually applied for a patent herself, um, and these pieces can be cooked together and they stick together, or it can be taken off. And you can just wear the skirt. Uh, and the point is, you know, she herself had worked really hard to come up with a sustainable line of clothing. Um, the clothes are extremely well crafted, and uh, they're meant to last and be investment pieces for a long time. But she didn't want to immediately start. Can you use Oh, sure. She didn't immediately want to go towards, um, you know, immediately going to venture capital. She wanted to take her time and develop a product on her own terms, work with her workforce, really develop people. And so I think at this point now she's looking into um, expanding. And I think hopefully the trademark system or others can help her, but also looking at utility patents or others that can really um, help her maybe maintain her, um, her presence, but also potentially pa partners with others to get these products out and help women, uh, you know, who are busy, who are out there, you know, doing everything to have these flexible clothes that will meet their needs.
Well, and, and what an inspiring story to end the conversation on. Um, just, I, I love that. I love everything from the high tech to the, um, to the clothing. Um, and it just reinforces that whatever you're doing, check to see if you have IP, because somebody might think, I can't patent what I'm wearing um, and what I'm designing, but if you go to our IP identifier tool, if you go to the pro bono council, people are happy to guide you on the way to say, well, that's copyrightable, that's tr a trade secret, this is something where you can get a design patent, which is more on like the shape and not the utility of it, um, or a utility patent, and I know these are a lot of words that people may not know all of them, but we, we'll teach you. I mean, it's, it's once you know the nomenclature, it's, it's much simpler than you think, and the access is, is really there. So with that, I do want to open it up to questions from the audience. If you didn't already submit your question, feel free to submit them now, and I will turn things over to Allison to ask the questions that have come in. Thank you so much, Director Vidal, and thank you to all of the panelists for a really insightful and honestly inspiring conversation. I'm inviting you all to a, uh, a, a, a get together with her uh, for Deploy. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fabulous. Um, so we've got a number of questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Our first one is actually touching on a point that I, a number of our panelists made about thinking about your investors strategically. So I think for many investor, for many entrepreneurs, early stage innovators, they really want investors that are going to help them grow in the direction that the innovator wants to head in. And so, how do you think about vetting your investors? You know, we've talked a lot about the the inverse. You know, them vetting you. How do you vet them? can start there. Um, so um, this is where network is really, really important, <laughs> I would say. So before you're getting ready to go raise a dollar, right, I think you have, the first step is really putting your list together of all of those investors that you're thinking about um, talking with and sharing your ideas with. And, and the way that I've done it, and I've kind of been, I've heard from, through the, the great friend from other founders, is you do want a good blend of, of expert specialists who kind of know your space really well, but then you do want some diversity in terms of the thought and the people that you might bring to the table that you're gonna be interacting with for the, the lifetime of your company, right? So for us, we're a diagnostic company, having people that have uh, experience in healthcare that can help navigate those really kind of treacherous waters on the regulatory front is really important, but then equally so, we might wanna do licensing deals. So there are VCs and, and, and investors who have tons of experience and know that business and it can really vet you, and then you feel really well equipped to be going and starting to have those conversations. So I think it's being strategic about the way you're putting your investor list together. You're going to talk to hundreds of investors. So grouping them and, and prioritizing them and how you're wanting to build your network. Again, this is your network. Your investors are your part of your network. Um, they're your partner. And so I think that's really, that's how we've, I've, I've been taught and trained <laughs> to do it, but I'm sure other people have thoughts. It can be difficult if you don't have that familiarity. I think what I found is being having the candor and giving them the, the, the permission to be completely candid with you is very important. A lot of euphemistic conversations go on when you're fundraising. I'm going to do this. Oh, that sounds great. But really being able to say to them, like, what, what are your kind of, you know, fears and and hopes and dreams for this you know in other words and here you know here's my concern how would you deal with that like kind of trying to troubleshoot them a little bit once you're in a dialogue I think is really helpful not only will they feel that they're part of the problem solving in the organization and the and the technology potentially but you might also learn something relative to their ideas and I think that inclusion again is really what gives people affinity to want to fund so the, so the best uh, thing to do uh, is to call the founders in their portfolio. Right? How does this investor treat you? Wh on the list of people you call when things are bad, where are they? Are they at the bottom or are they, are they at the top? And that's where you'll get really good information. I, I think that's fantastic. And this is such an important question. So I'm so glad it was asked. I will say that because because entrepreneurship and innovation and intellectual property is so valuable, there are people who are going to want to take it. And so it is really important that you vet your funders because there are people who are out there who are acting as if they are funders with the idea that they just want to take your idea. Um, and so if you haven't protected it with IP, even if you have, uh, just being very careful that you're meeting with funders who are reputable um, and who you can trust. And all of this advice will help you find those right funders. So we have a few questions that are more or less the same flavor, so I'm gonna combine them. So we have a number of folks who have written and said that they have a provisional patent or they have early stage designs on their invention, on their, on their future product. How do you make the approach to investors? How do you make the first ask? And I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I wanna make sure that everybody has the opportunity to address this question because I think it's a really important one. 
I can start with what we look for at Skydeck. Uh, even at the very earliest stages, where maybe they haven't even filed yet or they're just filing, we look for evidence that they are thinking about a patent strategy and not just, I'm gonna file in these places or these regions, but either we have a strategy or we know we have to develop one and it's an ongoing skill that we must maintain uh, at a, as a startup. I think you really have to understand your capital needs as to, as to who you're gonna approach. You know, what kind of money are you looking for? How much do you need and what's it gonna get you? And I think that the mismatch happens is when you go and ask for money from, from a group that's either not aligned, they wanna to put too much capital to work or they don't have enough. And so I think really understanding your scope and what you wanna achieve and where you see your inflections um, is pretty critical. I think things like SBIR, other things that can give you, you know, the, the, the funds to really understand, you know, your first problem, have your first problem, solve it, and then go to get funding so people can see that you've overcome stuff. And I also think that it's okay to reach out when you don't need money and to socialize ideas with them and get feedback and then go back and show them that you've actually met the milestone you said you were going to you were gonna meet. I think persistence is incredibly important because there are a lot of no's, but when people can get, can get to know you and have that trust that you are someone that will see a problem and solve it and still be resilient, that's pretty important. So don't always go and create those relationships just when you need the money. Money. I'll add to that and say from the provisional patent question specifically, because we were actually in that um, uh, in that realm when we first raised our first dollars. We didn't have a patent filed yet. They were we had two that were provisional um, phases, and it really was having those discussions about what is the risk if they don't go forward, right? So that's a really great exercise, and you get to hear kind of how your investor perceives those risks and how they're going, having those conversations, building that communication conduit with that investor or those investors is really important. So it's a great opportunity to start to learn about their interactions. I might just add one more thing on the provisional patent. Like, act, act like it's your... Act like it's your real patent. When you're filing, try not to put something in that is so light because you're, you're really, I mean, I, I think don't use the provisional system as just kind of a placeholder. Be serious about the kind of support you put in and the kind of creativity you put in your provisional. Well, and I think that's a good place to end is on the provisional patent because access to the system is low. Provisional patents, depending upon your size, it's under $100 to file one. And it's just a place where once you've developed all the technology or all of your ideas, it's a place where you can get it on file. And then it's a placeholder for a year. So you get your filing date, which is really important because you really need to be the first that, that invented. And so you get your filing date. You, you've now filed first, which is important. Um, and then you get that time to think about, is this worth pursuing? Do I want to, do I want to invest more in this and, and, and move forward? And you can file multiple of them. So that's a great place to end. I want to thank the panelists and then turn it over to Allison. Um, I'm so excited to spend this time with all of you. And I, I imagine our audience has just been so inspired by, by all of your wisdom. Um, and this will be online. Um, and I will say to the extent we did not get to questions, we are doing an FAQ. So um, we are coming up with all the questions that were asked, not only today, but in all of our sessions. So there'll be a place where you can go to get your answers. And I, with that, I will turn it over to Allison and thank uh, UC Berkeley uh, for hosting us today. I want to echo Director Vidal's comments here and thank our panelists for their uh, fantastic insight. We're really lucky to have you all here today. Um, thank you to all of our attendees, both in person and online. I highly encourage that you check out more information about the WE initiative. You can find that on the website at uspto.gov slash initiative slash WE, W-E. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next program. Have a wonderful rest of your day.